It's eight o'clock in the east. Do you know where your children are? Uh, this week uh, is a little early for my uh, partners, <laughs> it seems, <laughs> given that we've gone on to daylight saving time. Uh, outside, it looks about like what you see in the picture, perhaps. But um, anyway, for the coming weeks, I'm going to be reading from and commenting on two books. Uh, I'm going to do them in tandem and side by side. Uh, the first book is The Unseen Partner uh, by Diane Croft. And uh, the the subtitle is Love and Longing in the Unconscious. Now, this book is quite special. Uh, I, uh, when I received it, I started to look at it and I showed it to my mother-in-law and she became engrossed in it and she wouldn't give it back. <laughs> And that's how it's been going since it arrived in my household. Um, so anyway, I'm very excited about this book because it, at a basic level, covers individuation uh, in the Jungian sense. And the second book I'll be working with is this book, um, A Mystical Path Less Traveled, A Jungian Psycho Psychological Perspective. And in this book, uh, Jerry Wright, who is a retired Presbyterian minister and Jungian analyst, uh, is going to uh, talk about the future for Western religions. And so I think you'll find both of them quite fascinating. And I'm prepared to uh, field all your comments and questions. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and begin with The Unseen Partner. And the way this book is structured is that, uh, uh, let's see, I'm going to turn off my cloaking so that you can see this better. All right, so the way this book is structured is um, on facing pages. Uh, first of all, there's a poem uh, and an image that Diane Croft has selected and a topic. And on the left-hand page is a quote from someone famous and then uh, Diane's commentary. And what she's done is put together basically the process of individuation. This book was given to her uh, in numinous moments over a period of three years in the form of the poems. And then she began to put it together as it, as it appears today. Uh, it's won a National Book Award. It's a wonderful book. And so I'm going to be reading from this, The Unseen Partner, Love and Longing in the Unconscious by Diane Croft. <clears throat> and so the first item is silence. Silence spoke to sound, pervasive and persuasive. No other came before her. Sound felt small, fragmented, momentary. Silence forgave sound again and again. She remained eternally his. And the image she has is uh, creation of the world one by uh, Michelagius, Constantinus, Curleonis of Lithuania. This is, this is the image here. And so the, the quote that comes with this topic, silence, is from Meister Eckert. In the midst of silence, a hidden word was spoken to me. And then uh, this is Diane's commentary. Silence, this struck me as a strange poem when I first wrote it. 
but I've come to see it as a symbolic dialogue between the temporal and the eternal, the profane and the sacred, the I, sound, and the thou, silence. The I is the individual, limited in time and space, and capable of being defined. The thou is the eternal source from which everything arises, which I had always envisioned as a deity separate and outside of me. What this experience showed me was a powerful presence that lives within. Jung, as recorded in his Red Book, established a conscious relationship, a dialogue with this living presence and spent the rest of his life trying to understand it. He thought of it as the God image within, how we experience the sacred, and he called it the self. This poem captures some of the characteristics of Jung's ego-self relationship. The self is the supreme authority within the psyche and represents it totality and represents its totality, both conscious, both consciousness and the unconscious. It is fragmented in that it can never manifest the totality of the unconscious mystery from which it arose. Luckily, the transpersonal self remains an eternal fount of creativity in our lives, especially when the ego assumes its proper, more humble role in the relationship. She remained eternally his. I'll just read the uh, poem once again. Silence spoke to sound pervasive and persuasive. No other came before her. Sound felt small, fragmented, momentary. Silence forgave sound again and again. She remained eternally his. Okay, so this is the beginning. Um, it is a reference to among other things, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And, um, and so I'll leave it at that at the moment, since I don't have fellow commentators uh, at the moment. I will, uh, I'm just going to go on, but of course, you're uh, welcome to comment in the chat, and I'm going to just look and see. Uh, I need to break out this chat. Okay, so uh, okay, so that gets the chat going uh, on YouTube and you are certainly welcome to comment at any time. So I'm going to now begin uh, the process of reading Jerry Wright's book. And so again, uh, I'm reading segments from A Mystical Path Less Traveled, A Jungian Psychological Perspective. And this book is very special because it pulls together all of we Westerners common angst about Western religion. And I mean, all the Abrahamic religions uh, to which uh, Dr. Wright is addressing himself. And so uh, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to, um, sorry, I'm just getting my, desktop squared away. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is read a segment out of the introduction. I think I may have read it last week, but in order to put it in context, everything that I'm going to read in coming weeks, <clears throat> I want to uh, read it again. And this answers the question that uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson 
had so much trouble in responding to uh, a couple years back when he was doing large lectures and he was continually asked, do you believe in God? And I found that in his interview with uh, Jonathan Peugeot on March 1st, he was still having that problem. <clears throat> and so I sent him a letter uh, with this, uh, with a quote from this two pages of Dr. Wright's book. So Dr. Wright wrote another book um, two years earlier, The, the Reimagining of, of God and Religion. I'll also be using uh, this book in future sessions. But for now, I'm just going to first read a quote from that book. And uh, it's as follows. Looking back from a place far down the evolutionary road, we may see the religions of the past as necessary stages along a twisting labyrinthine path toward the realization that we are, in fact, what we imagined our former deities and devils to be. Our species will come to recognize and to own both our glory and our gory that were projected, necessarily so, on the ex external deities and devils. In the wisdom of psyche, we will conclude that it was necessary to see our creative and destructive capacities in projected form until we could own and manifest both responsibly. Squinting, that is as far as I can see. And so that was in Reimagining God and Religion. Uh, and then he says this. When I have verbalized this conclusion to audiences who have invited me to speak, I am met with a combination of bewilderment, disbelief, and sheer terror on the one hand. And on the other hand, if the audience is familiar with analytical psychology, a knowing nod that someone has said what they have always suspected. We have treated all, we have created all our deities and devils from numinous experiences that come upon us uninvited and unbidden. Since falling off the back porch of the church, I am often asked, well, do you still believe in God? I love the question. It's like throwing me into the proverbial briar patch with Br'er Rabbit. It is one of the most important questions at this crisis stage of this, at this crisis stage of the soul of our species. Rather than asking the inquirer what he or she means by the word God and thereby dodging the question, I often ask a clarifying question. Do you mean the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition, the God of the Old and New Testaments, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? After receiving an affirmative response, I reply, no, of course not. I then amplify. That God image of my ancestors is no longer meaningful for me, though in my childhood and early adulthood, it was the center of my religious and church life, but its shelf life has expired. It had a best by age 30 expiration date. After that, it was no longer nourishing. It was tasteless and likely toxic for me personally. With the Sufi mystics, it is sufficient for me to say, there is no God except the experience of God. Or I echo Carl Jung near the end of his life when he asked if, when asked if he believed in God, his mystical reply was, I know, I don't need to believe, I know. At this stage of my life, when I speak of God, I mean the animating powers and felt presences at the heart of matter itself and at the heart of all that does matter. 
God is no longer an external, supernatural, metaphysical, interventionist being. That was a good story once upon a time, but these times demand more, beginning with taking more responsibly for our own godlike capacities for the great good. Let me read that sentence again, sorry. <clears throat> That was a good story once upon a time, but these times demand more, beginning with taking more responsibly our own godlike capacities for great good and great evil. God is being itself, life itself, in all its mystical mixture, and we are its human conduit. With such a perspective, life is a mystical path. Every step, every day, every moment, everywhere, and every when. Note to the reader, the following paragraph is a good example of an unconscious reverie. Personally, the process of writing and speaking about unanswerable yet unavoidable questions and mysteries continues to serve the following purpose to further free my mind, heart, and soul from the religious constraints that were a part of my religious indoctrination, constraints that remain in place for me and for the majority of Western culture and likely beyond, although I am no authority on anyone beyond the borders of my own skin. And even within those fleshy borders, I remain a mystery to myself all the while proposing that I am able to see others most clearly, especially those who disturb and disgust me. Their numbers multiplying daily in the weeks approaching and following a national election, an election whose outcome was foreordained to breed more chaos and contempt, a diet on which we continue to feed daily. I have decided to leave the unedited preceding long run-on sentence. It is in memory and honor of a most honest critic of my previous book. Still intellectually sharp at age 95, he found the book topic very interesting. When his daughter, who had suggested he read the book, asked what he thought about it, he replied, he writes long sentences. <laughs> Okay, now I want to just read another short portion of, um, of the introduction. I'm skipping ahead to page nine. Um, so I'll just read from uh, the middle of the page. It has been suggested that all writing is autobiographical, and so it is, just as all reading carries the same subjective designation. In the final analysis, all writing, reading, and proclaiming about the mysteries we have designated religious, spiritual, or divine are subjective, although we seem desperate as a series to claim other as a species, although we seem desperate as a species to claim otherwise. This desperation has caused way too much pain, division, and bloodshed, and may well be our undoing as a species. My writing is directed to those who have a hunger for the holy, yet who no longer look to traditional religions for soul food. I am also writing for a large group of religious veterans those who have served their time in the monotheistic tribal wars. Some, like me, served on the front lines as religious professionals. Many were wounded in those wars with deep scars as proof. Many were captured and tortured by a lifetime of unnecessary shame and guilt. Some have managed to escape and now search for a spiritual worldview and a path that make tribal religious warfare unnecessary. 
drawing on the analytical psychology of Carl Gustav Jung and his many interpreters and amplifiers, as well as various mystical traditions, these pages will propose an alternative path, a mystical path less traveled. Again, you are invited to read with your own journal in hand. The contents therein will be your most valuable and most authoritative resource for your own path. So in this last paragraph, he's referring to the Red Book and the fact that Dr. Jung, near the end of his life, uh, wrote to one of his, uh, his patients and suggested that they keep their own Red Book. And the idea is that you start to learn what comes from your own unconscious and put it down and keep track of it. So this would obviously include dreams and visions, but it also includes um, uh, numinous moments or photographs. And so in a way, this YouTube channel is dedicated to the things that I have experienced in my lifetime in many ways, because each time I do one of these sessions, I am obviously selecting things that are meaningful to me. I hope they're meaningful to you. And it, since I have a following now, it seems that they are. Uh, so uh, the suggestion is pick up a notebook, um, and start to uh, make notes of what what your unconscious is saying to you. And if some of th these suggestions uh, come to mind or help spark that, that would be a good thing. Okay, so now um, I want to go back and emphasize the structure of the coming few weeks. Um, so I'm reading. Uh, two books. One is called The Unseen Partner, Love and Longing in the Unconscious by Diane Croft, which I consider an, a basic book to understand the individuation process, which we often speak of and which Dr. Jung spent his whole career working on. And the second book is A Mystical Path Less Traveled, a Jungian psychology, psychological perspective um, by Jerry Wright. Uh, this book is published by Chiron Publications and um, Dr. Wright has given me permission to read uh, segments of it. Uh, he's written quite a few uh, very powerful poems in this book but I have committed to him that I will not read the poems. I'm only going to read uh, the journal entries and uh, discuss those. And so, um, so that's the way we will roll for the next couple of we weeks, probably until summer at least. So I'm going to go back now to uh, The Unseen Partner, and I'm going to go to the second page or the second set of pages, pages two and three. And the topic for this seg segment is called a priori. And a priori meaning that which was given or came before. And so the structure of this book is there's a poem. Uh, there's an image that Dr. Uh, Croft has selected. Uh, there's a quote from a famous author, and then there's Dr. Kraut's own commentary. And so let me um, read this poem. A priori, when words fail, as these will, I can touch the time before we spoke when the air carried our emotions into the world without distortion, to rest on a leaf or fly with a sparrow, free to roam safely with abandon. And uh, the image she has here is mountain magpie, sparrows, and bramble. 
by Huang Ajukai, China, 10th century. And so that's the image she has. Let's see. Right there. Okay. All right. The quote is The self, like the unconscious, is an a priori existent out of which the ego evolves. C.G. Jung from Psychology and Religion. And then uh, Diane Croft's commentary. A priori, at birth, we were pre-conscious, pre-verbal, mythically living in the garden of paradise. This is our original state of being, one with life itself. As we acquire language and develop an ego consciousness, we move into a state of duality. We begin to define the world and ourselves subjectively. I am this, you are that. Thus our sense of self and of the world become distorted and necessarily so. During the first part of life, we must set ourselves apart with the collective psyche in order to establish an individual identity, ego. Only a healthy ego can assimilate and manifest the instinctual energies of the untamed, primordial unconscious, the self. But if by the second part of life, we do not become aware of an inner force that defies personal willpower of an authority greater than the I, we reject the sacred gift of becoming what we were meant to be. This power, this poem reminds us of the beauty of ordinary awareness, an aspect of our being that witnesses life without judgment. And I'll read the poem once again, a priori. When words fail, as these will, I can touch the time before we spoke when the air carried our emotions into the world without distortion to rest on a leaf or fly with a sparrow, free to roam safely with abandon. Okay, so that was the second contribution by Diane Croft. And now I will go back to Dr. Wright. Awfully quiet over there. So if you wish to make comments, please do. Okay, now what Dr. Um, what Dr. Wright has done is uh, in his book, he's uh, put little leafs with journal entries. And so I'm not going to read the poem in deference to him uh, because he's going to join us uh, sometime in June for a wisdom path session. And you'll be able to ask him any question you want at that time. So if you uh, want to follow the wisdom path, uh, I'll put the link in just a moment. Um, but this is uh, his journal entry for December 20th. 2015. This morning, as I was showering, a question presented itself to my consciousness. So where are you now in your relationship with the church, your Christian heritage, and to religion itself? I waited for an image to appear. Rather than trying to create one, and rather than let me start that again. Uh, it's early. Good morning, Samantha. It's quite early for you. Uh, and listening is a good thing uh, going on. I waited for an image to appear rather than trying to create one. And it did, although I resisted it at first. It was a waking vision that played out for the remainder of the shower and many minutes beyond. No longer in the back porch of the church, I see myself out in the adjacent cemetery 
where I am witnessing a massive memorial and burial service. As I allow the image to unfold, it becomes clear that what I am witnessing is a memorial and burial service, not only of the church and the 2000 year old Christian myth, but the myths of other monotheistic traditions as well, each of which has been supported by a supernatural theistic God image. Such an image is no longer viable or even possible from a depth psychological perspective. As the image continues to play out before me, I realize that this funeral memorial service has been going on for a long time. I am not the first to witness it, nor will I be the last. It appears that what is taking place is the religious in the religious cemetery will take a long time perhaps generations. Yet it appears that for religions to be vital and meaningful for the future, a continuous stream of religious adherents will need to make their journey to the cemetery to pay their respects for what has died, to celebrate, that, to celebrate the life that was, to mourn its demise, to endure the identifiable stages of grief, including shock and denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance, and to wait an, and to await a new beginning. End of the vision. Good morning, Jero and Cephas. Good morning, everyone. All right, this vision gave birth to many of the themes included in my previous book. The following is a summary of that work, along with an urgent challenge, quote, with the necessary demise and death of antique cosmologies and traditional religious paradigms, dependent on external supernatural deities and, de and devils, the modern religious challenge involves two simultaneous sacred endeavors, to, eul to eulogize, bury, and grieve the theistic and monotheistic God images and the religious paradigms dependent upon them, and secondly, to bring fresh imagination to the meanings of God and religion that will satisfy both the modern mind and the ancient soul. As, I, as long as our deities and devils are perceived to be beyond physical life and the life of the human psyche, our species will continue to do great harm to ourselves, to each other, and to our nest. Okay. Now, I'm not so convinced that uh, personally uh, that we have to uh, throw out uh, and bury our traditional theistic religions. While I agree with Dr. Wright in every way about this book in general, um, I have come to believe, and many of you know this, that there is a role for all of these religions. And that is as a kind of right romper worthy for the psyche before we were uh, smart enough and experienced enough to face our own selves. And so the way I see it is we live in my little red ball. My little red ball represents chaos and uh, we all live in chaos right now because um, as human beings, we're asked to do things that no other generation of our species has ever been asked to do. And that is to grok or uh, fully 
internalize all of the information of the world. And that's a very, very big thing. Uh, so just for example, uh, the human of the 16th century at most was called upon to understand as much information as in one edition of the New York Times. So imagine the New York Times, which you can buy at your local 7-Eleven this morning. Um, and it's a very thick newspaper, but that would represent all the knowledge that you would face in a lifetime. And that was true up until at least the 16th century. Now, since the so-called enlightenment, we've been expanding our knowledge uh, very dramatically. Um, I call it the endarkenment for reasons that some of you will know. Um, and, um, and so um, today we have basically through the internet, all the information of the world. And uh, Jason, uh, thank you for your comment about my age and whether I'm saying anything of interest to you. Obviously, uh, you're too immature to understand what it is I'm talking about. And so you can feel free to take your individuation elsewhere. And if you make further comments like that, I will ban you from this uh, YouTube channel permanently. Uh, just so you know, um, I don't, I'm not here to deal with your individuation. Um, So anyway, uh, all right, so the next section, okay, uh, Jason, you're out of here, sorry. You go take your individuation elsewhere and Godspeed. Okay, so uh, I've already banned one person from the channel this morning. Maybe I can do more, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> okay, so the third section. Um, now I'm reading from The Unseen Partner uh, by Diane Fr Croft, uh, Love and Longing in the Unconscious. And this segment is called Afterbirth. First, the poem. So afraid of are we of the dark, where once we floated buoyant, nourished by underground streams, lulled to sleep by the tribal beat of two hearts in sink, forced out in swamp and mud, a fiery cry at the shock of light, blinded at birth. And so uh, Diane has selected this image to represent uh, afterbirth. And uh, the title of it is Shade and Darkness, The Evening of the Deluge, 1843, Joseph Mallard, William Turner, England. Photo is copyright of the Tate Museum in London, 2015. And on the other page, uh, Diane is always putting a quote and then her commentary. And so I will provide the quote and the commentary. The quote, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. Wordsworth, William Wordsworth, owed on intimations of immortality. And here's what Diane says about it. After birth, in the beginning, the ego was contained within the womb of the unconscious self and created out of it. The shock of light here symbolizes the shock of consciousness. For ego consciousness to form, it must separate from its unconscious matrix, the dark, 
but it's a rupture so deep it gets erased from conscious memory. There is no birth of consciousness without pain. This is the never healing wound of separation. Theology teaches a similar message that humans forget their original oneness with God. Some memory of our original state of wholeness manifests as ex existential longing, a feeling of lack throughout life. Listen to the story told by the reed of being separated. Since I was cut from the reed bed, I have made this crying sound. Anyone apart from someone he loves understands what I say. Anyone pulled from a source longs to go back. And that was a poem. Let's see if I can find the, the reference to that. Okay, the footnote is um, from Ru uh, Rumi from the Reed Flute's song in the essential Rumi translated by Coleman Barts with John Moyne, uh, 1995, published by Harper Collins. Okay, so that was the third segment from Diane Croft. Um, now I'm going to go back to um, Jerry Wright. So the other book I'm reading all t uh, in tandem is A Mystical Path Less Traveled, A Union Psychological Perspective uh, by Jerry Wright. And I, I've just read the segment about his vision where he imagined that we have to hold a funeral for the Abrahamic religions and um, and then we have to bring a fresh idea and so this is his um, second journal entry here before the gift of self-reflection in the most recent 200,000 years of the 13.8 billion year cosmic unfolding there were no powers and presences named gods, goddesses, deities, and devils, nor theology or religion. We created those categories from our experience of the mysteries in which we found ourselves. We did not create the experiences themselves, yet all the names and categories were from the human imagination. The universe is a metaphorical cosmic canvas whose origins are unknown and ultimately unknowable. Our species is invited and compelled to fill the canvas with words, images, and symbols that emer emerge from our unconscious depths. This ancient art is our attempt to find meaning concerning our place against the mysterious backdrop. Some of the pictures we paint are termed religious, others are considered science or art, and some are simply wordless wonder and awe. As human creations, our pictures are temporary rather than timeless, partial rather than complete, and ever in need of, adapt of updating, lest they become idolatrous and objects of worship. Regular imaginative updates may be the most important task for the continuance of our species. Again, it was we who named our felt experiences of the natural world, employing words like gods, goddesses, spirits, demons, mana, Brahman, Zeus, and more recently, God. In this sense, we created our deities and devils, and assign names and dwelling places in the outer landscape and later place them in heaven and hell. While creating our deities, devils, and sub subsequent religions was necessary, we must also confess that they are necessary fictions 
that must be continually reimagined, revised, and rewritten. Religions and the gods at their core are human creations. This is bitter medicine for religious tribalism. Okay, now I want to go back to my metaphor. Um, remember, I was talking about all the information that we face, and that's chaos. And we are always faced with this ball of chaos. And what all religions do, not only the Abrahamic religions, but also um, Buddhism, Jainism, and uh, Hinduism, among, and Shintoism, among many others, um, what they all do is give us a moment to step back from this chaos and reflect. And this is what Dr. Wright is talking about. Uh, we are reflecting on our world and what it means. And that's something that all religions do for us. Um, you don't need to do it through an organized religion, but the organized religions basically offer an elementary school for us, or maybe a middle school, early middle school, in the sense that uh, we learn the rungs and you can learn the rungs uh, from a psychologist. Uh, you can learn them from a mu musician. You can learn them from pop music sometimes. Uh, and they take you step by step into understanding uh, your life. And so that's what Dr. Wright is talking about in this segment. And um, I urge you to reflect on that idea because that's what they do. You, you know, you can't reflect on gods and, and deities and devils um, if you don't understand what the words mean. And so obviously when you're in elementary school, you learn a few words that are useful to you. Um, but ultimately you have to reflect on it yourself based on your own experience and we all have these experiences. I have religious experiences every single day. And uh, I, what I'm blessed with is the ability to see those experiences and understand them. Um, and uh, Manuela is here. Good morning, Manuela. Uh, everybody's up early today, <laughs> getting an early start. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm going to um, go back to Diane Croft again, and uh, this is an interaction between these two books. Um, so, um, so again, in Diane Croft's book, The Unseen Partner, um, she's referring to inside. Uh, the title of this segment, both sides of it, uh, is Inside, and I'll start over here with the poem. Um, and so the poem is, Inside lies the secret of my birth, like a baby it cries for something it does not know by name, only by touch. How the mouth moves when the nipple draws near. Okay. That was the poem. And the image uh, is here. And it's called Heart and Egg, 2007 by Stephen Parker of Alaska. And then the quote, the inner subtle essences can be contemplated only by sucking, not by knowing. Isaac the Blind, 12th and, search and 13th century Kabbalist. And then uh, these are Diane Croft's comments. Inside. Symbolically, this poem intimates that the journey toward a more authentic self is an inner process. Inside lies the secret. The primordial self contains within itself an urge, an instinct toward balance, whether we are aware of it or not. Jung called this self-regulating wisdom, the self. 
an inner agency that operates outside our conscious will and volition, what Freud interpreted as repressed instinctual drives in the unconscious that must be controlled and tolerated. Jung saw a transformative instinctual patterns that crave recognition. So how do we gain access to this wisdom? The deep unconscious layers of the psyche speak through symbols and or images. Indeed, Jung thought the creation of symbols to be the most important function of the unconscious. These poems and commentaries attempt to make conscious some of these symbols of the archetypal psyche and the messages they bear. To me, this painting by Stephen Parker symbolizes the ego egg being carried within the larger primordial self womb. And so that's the image and I'll read the poem once again. Inside lies the secret of my birth, like a baby it cries for something it does not know by name, only by touch. How the mouth moves when the nipple draws near. Okay, so that is the next segment. And uh, certainly these morning sessions, I know it's, it's a, it's a shocking morning because we're on daylight saving time now. So it got to be even an hour earlier. And some of my followers here I know are in the, on the West Coast of the United States. So uh, for them, it's about five, almost six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it must seem very early. I'm grateful for you being here, uh, my friend, my friends, my regular friends that are here, as well as everyone else. But if you're interested in uh, following, being on the panel and helping me talk about these things, that would be very nice. So I look forward to you joining us. Um, I know that uh, Samantha is on the West Coast and and Manuela is in Argentina. And so this is reaching a very wide audience. Okay, I'm not going to read everything in Dr. Wright's book because I want you to go buy the book. Uh, so I'm reading uh, A Mystical Path Less Traveled, A Union Psychological Perspective. And, um, so I'm going to read um, segments that are very meaningful to me. So journal entry, the cosmic canvas refers to the cosmic order, the backdrop that we can only dimly divine. It is truly the great mystery that will remain so even as we continue to peel back the outer layers. Jung sometimes referred to this backdrop as the psychoid level beneath the level he described as archetypal. <clears throat> this was his way of imagining that the collective unconscious archetypes and complexes rest on a larger unknown and unknowable foundation. We keep confusing our deities and their names with the unknown backdrop. Then in our need to protect those names, we continue to create divisive religious tribes, all the while, all the while claiming that we are defending our faith. And so some of these ideas are hard to, uh, digest at the beginning, I know, but um, Dr. Wright is calling out all religions uh, on the idea that we've created religious tribes and therefore uh, we have to defend our original ideas. It's like uh, you paint a picture and, and you defend that picture with your life. And, uh, and so, uh, and maybe you have a few followers who like your picture and so they all circle around you and protect you, but 
other people hate your picture so they won't talk to you and all and on we go into the human history and so um so we have to be careful and rethink reflect upon some of these things patrick says um I'm still trying to figure out how half the population of the world is correct and the other half is wrong. Um, well, actually, Patrick, um, everybody is correct and everyone is wrong because the world is a whole. And so you have to think of it like the yin yang symbol. And uh, let me just share it with you. Uh, and I'll, I'll share one particular version of it that I particularly like and it is applicable to all of us, which is this one. Okay, and, and so uh, I have a coffee mug uh, that uh, I bought in Arizona. It says, uh, if a man speaks in the desert and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? And it's kind of a joke. joke. Um, it, I've also seen it, a version of it that says, uh, if a man speaks in the woods and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? Well, the answer to that question is yes, uh, he is, because he only represents half of the whole. And so the masculine and feminine each contribute a part to the whole. Um, and so um, we have to understand the whole. And so I guess we used to think uh, in, the, in our patriarchal thinking that uh, the man was the head of the household and the wife had to follow along behind. And in fact, in, in Japan, uh, wives typically typically walk behind their husband, um, which I'm very familiar with from my eight years of living in Japan. <clears throat> but what we have to understand is that when we uh, find a life partner, uh, and I don't mean um, physical gender, I mean someone who complements what we know and how we live, um, there are inevitably going to be conflicts and we need to, when we get angry with our partner, our spouse, um, our friend that shares our life with us, uh, we need to be tolerant of the fact that they're very often going to have other ideas and um, they will be wrong to you as well. And so, and you will be wrong to them. And yet the whole is the union of the two. And so we all need to um, be sensitive to this fact. And if we are, I think we will have fewer divorces. And I admit that by the time I was uh, 39, uh, I didn't really understand this. We haven't properly taught it to our children. And the result is that we have 50% divorces approximately in the US and we have 50% uh, of all, or all, 50 of all children are, re, are raised by their mothers typically. And so we have very one-sided uh, perceptions of the world, and we need to change that. And if we do change it, then um, then uh, we'll live happier lives. I'm convinced of that. And since I went through one divorce in my own life, I'm absolutely certain that that's true because that's my personal experience. So let me go back and take a look to comments here and 
And Patrick says, all are chosen, none are chosen. Indeed, yes, we're all chosen to find our path in life, our individuation. And so all of us were born of a seed, whether it was um, an acorn for an oak tree or uh, the joining of, of a sperm and an egg in the human being. Um, and that seed already contains everything that yourself wants you to become. Okay, so we can describe, we'll talk about an oak tree. An oak tree is an oak tree and we can describe an oak tree and know that all the oak trees on the planet have certain characteristics, but every oak tree is different. And every oak tree faces whatever traumas that it faces in life, whether it be storms or um, men coming along and cutting off limbs so that they can put power lines through the oak tree, whatever it is, but the oak tree just keeps putting out uh, new shoots. And so if you, if you lose an arm uh, or, you know, if you lose an arm, if we take Senator da Tammy Duckworth, um, she lost both of her legs and yet she was able to uh, still become a U.S. Senator and give birth while serving in the Senate. <laughs> and, and so uh, she knows her path and she is in touch with herself. And that's what we all need to do, in my opinion. And so for what it's worth, uh, we all need to understand ourself and what ourself, what our deep unconscious uh, wants us to be in and do that. Um, let's see. And so Patrick says, our culture pushes promiscuity. Advertising is to blame a lot. Oh, well, in a way, yes, I agree with that. And um, so I, I used to joke that, um, that my class in college, which was the class of 1968, was the last class of the Victorian era. So uh, before my class, um, everything was very straight laced and you had to make sure that you didn't make any mistakes sexually uh, because you would ruin your life and so on. And I went to a college that was an all men's college at the time that I went there. But the year I graduated, we admitted women and <laughs> we started to admit women. <laughs> and we were so screwed up in our thinking that the college, that we created a separate college, a coordinate college, uh, across the street from my college that was a women's college. Uh, it was called Kirkland College. And it's something, think of uh, Yale and, or I'm sorry, Harvard and Vassar. Um, and um, so there were many men's colleges and many women's colleges. There still are a few, I suppose. But <clears throat> um, finally in 1968, we brought women to Hamilton College Hill and oh my God, uh, interactions changed and uh, the women's college actually did not survive. It only lasted 10 years and uh, it was stupidly imagined because they uh, decided, okay, we wanna have a college that has no grades, no grade point average. And as a result of that, <clears throat> The women who went to Kirkland College for 10 years, uh, the way that they got into graduate school was their professors wrote letters about them and about their performance in every class. And that was, that was your grade, a letter from your professor for every class. And uh, obviously that was impossible for graduate schools. Uh, they had 
no idea what these letters meant. And <clears throat> so Kirkland started to solve the problem by going back and, and uh, saying, okay, well, we'll figure out what these letters mean <laughs> in terms of grades. So we could give these, you know, the few women that wanted to go on to graduate school, we would uh, figure out what their grade point average should have been if we'd given them grades. <laughs> and so, so uh, it was an unholy mess. And um, <laughs> this is at a college which uh, we now, in my family, we have three generations involved with this college. I was the first to go there, but then um, five years after I graduated from college, um, I helped my father get a job there. Um, he, after his career in the Navy, he became a, a college administrator, business uh, administrator. And so um, he became um, the first uh, financial manager of Kirkland College. Uh, and he was still there 10 years later when we uh, when we buried Kirkland College, or no, it was, I'm sorry, it was five years later, and then he became the um, then he became the chief accountant of Hamilton College, and uh, and Hamilton started to admit women, um, and so my father went through that transition, and it was a inglorious experience of. Um, our species, um, and good morning, you I welcome her evening. Um, and so it was a rather uh, inglorious episode in uh, the development of colleges in the United States, but you know, that's the way it is. And that's, we're, uh, let's see how did Churchill put it, Americans, always get the right answer after trying everything else. <laughs> and so the, the leaders of my college, uh, they're, uh, they realized that they had to bring women to College Hill, so, but they tried something else first, which was to create a separate women's college, and that collapsed after 10 years, so then we had to start over again. Um, okay, let's uh, see what else I want to read here. So here's a journal entry. Um, the urgent dangers we humans have created for ourselves necessitate a reimagining of God and religion, whereby we are no longer children of a heavenly parent, nor do we need an external savior who will magically rescue us. Rather, we must imagine that we are, in fact, the godlike and devil-like beings that we have long seen in projected form most notably on the faces of those we idealize and or demonize. Then, having recognized the disowned aspects of our individual and collective selves, we can take responsibility for our creative and destructive capacities. Until we do that difficult psychological work, our world will provide an unlimited quantity of scapegoats. It seems that what has proven to be eternal for our species has been the cycle of violence caused by the gods we have created and have felt obliged to defend. Human fear and greed are, are older than the gods we have imagined. Um, so I'll just read that last sentence again. Human fear and greed are older than got the gods we have imagined. Okay, um, and so the point is that we conjured all of our gods uh, from ourselves, 
but we didn't want to admit that they were ourselves, that they represented ourselves. So we put them out there. But the reality is um, they are ourselves. And so if we apply that uh, to the collective, we can see um, that precisely in what happened on January the 6th, obviously our former president was always into scapegoating. He, he never took responsibility for anything. Uh, and he always claimed that everything good was from him and everything bad was from somebody else. And he's the poster boy for exactly what Dr. Wright is uh, talking about here, where we have to take responsibility ourselves first, and then we can understand what we have to do uh, to lead the world into the next century. Okay, carrying on. Um, I, this seems to be working for everybody. If you're, if you don't like this format where I'm reading two books kind simultaneously, um, then um, please speak up. But otherwise, I'm going. Um, okay, so the next page in uh, Diane Croft's book, The Unseen Partner, uh, Love and Longing and the Unconscious, um, is uh, unforeseen. And so there's the image that goes with it and the poem. And uh, I'll just read uh, the poem here. When your freight, I'm sorry. When your face breaks into a smile, it widens my existence. I am. I am open to every possibility. Anything could happen, past, present, and future, as one merging into some, unfor into some unforeseen joy. Okay, I read that badly. <laughs> this early in the morning, I kick up my, my mouth around the words. So let me try again. <clears throat> it's a short poem, so it bears uh, repeating, and it's uh, called The Unforeseen. When your face breaks into smile, it widens my existence. I am open to every possibility, anything could happen, past, present, future, as one merging into some unforeseen joy. Okay. And um, the image is a flower of unknown origin, photo by Elucidate, uh, 2008. So that's the unforeseen. And the quote is, the ego is tempted into inflation to set itself above the purpose of God. Uh, Edward Edinger, Ego and Archetype, from his book, The Ego and Archetype. Uh, and there was a parenthetical in that quote i.e. to identify with the self. So let me read his quote again. The ego is tempted into inflation to set it. <clears throat> the ego is tempted into inflation to set itself above the purposes of God. That is to identify with the self. From Edward Edinger's book, Ego and Archetype. And then uh, Dr. Croft's comment, unforeseen, a serious encounter with the primordial self at any age sends the ego into bouts of euphoria or dysphoria quite out of the ordinary. This happens when the smaller ego unconsciously identifies with the grander properties of the self, the energies of desire, of pleasure, of power and wears them personally. It's not hard to notice inflated egos everywhere we look, but reminiscing on my own experience, I think a certain amount of religious zeal is necessary to weather an assault from the unconscious. 
in spite of the periodic ecstasy that accompanied the experience, I felt very much out of control, and that was not a feeling I enjoyed. In retrospect, I like the fact that the poem, which wrote itself, refers to this renewed relationship between my conscious ego and the larger primordial self as some unforeseen joy. This is a song of praise, of thanksgiving. Notice too that, ex that an experience of the self falls outside secular time, past, present, and future as one. This is the sacred time of myth and religion, the fabled time of in the beginning and ever after. So we've seen um, an inflated ego in our former president as an example. Everything was about him and not about the people of the United States. And the problem with that position and the scapegoating, which he's so famous for, it's so-and-so's fault, not mine, uh, is that you know there are 330 million other Americans who have different ideas. And uh, some of us take umbrage to his taking credit for everything that happened. And obviously he won't take credit for what happened at the Capitol on January 6th, um, because if he does, he'll find himself in uh, prison orange. That is his color, I understand, but <laughs> uh, I doubt if he'll ever serve a day in jail. Uh, but um, he's in the, in the history of the United States, he will be considered um, in a class by himself, I assure you. Uh, okay, so Patrick likes the readings, good, that's great. Uh, a bubble flask, a star pointed, painted balloon, both memories from a clownery act I watched as a child and an emergency clown nose, an emergency clown nose, red ball style. Felt like sharing that as a side note. Oh, that's good. Um, yesterday watched a documentary about German circus run Kali. Uh, they promoted three items from a gift shop, a bubble flask, a star painted balloon, both memories from a clownery act I watched as a child. Okay. Um, so, I guess as we see inflated egos around the place, uh, we should start <laughs> imagining them with a, <laughs> with a clown nose. That would be very good. <clears throat> okay, reading on, I'm reading on now uh, another uh, journal entry by uh, Dr. Jerry Wright in A Mystical Path Less Travel. I'm on page 21, just for those who might want to know. Our God images and religion seem frozen in ancient time while all else moved on. Religion seems to be on, the only discipline that refuses to update itself. However, consciously and unconsciously, our God images and religions have more powerful sway on our behavior and on our future than any other discipline. Why do we assume that our ancestors' views on the mystery of the universe are more sacred and more authoritative than our own? We will not be able to evolve as a healthy species until our deities and devils are returned to their home in the human psyche and allowed to mature. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. That's a pretty important paragraph, and it reminds me of a paragraph that was quoted in um, the first uh, essay in this book, Jung's Red Book for Our Time. And, um, and so I want to, it bears repeating, so I'm going to read it here so you can hear it again in context and understand what, what, what was being said. Um, so 
So uh, this was in a letter that Dr. Young wrote to the Reverend Martin T. Kelsey on the 3rd of May, 1958. So about three years before his death when he was 82. And here's what he said. We are still looking back to the Pentecostal events in a dazed way, instead of looking forward to the goal the spirit is leading us to. Therefore, mankind is wholly unprepared for the things to come. Man is compelled by divine forces to go forward to increasing consciousness and cognition, developing further and further away from his religious background because he does not understand it anymore. His religious teachers and leaders are still hypnotized by the beginnings of a then new eon of consciousness instead of understanding them and their implications. What one once called the Holy Ghost is an impelling force, creating wider consciousness and responsibility, and thus enriched cognition. The real history of the world seems to be the progressive incarnation of the deity. And so, um, I think most people probably didn't understand that quote, but here Dr. Wright has summed it up. I'm going to read that journal entry again. Our God images and religions seem frozen in ancient time while all else has moved on. Religion seems to be the only discipline that refuses to update itself. However, consciously and unconsciously, our God images and religions have more powerful sway on our behavior than on our, and on our future than any other discipline. Why do we assume that our ancestors' views on the mysteries of the universe are more sacred and more authoritarian, uh, sorry, authoritative than our own? We will not be able to evolve as a healthy species until our deities and devils are returned to their home in the human psyche and allowed to mature. Uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty damning quote there from uh, Dr. Wright, but exactly bang on. Big Cat says, um, Patrick says, trolls are heavy today. Yep. <clears throat> uh, the big cat says, <clears throat> as the Dalai Lama said, learn and obey the rules very well as you will know how to break them properly. That is the elementary school of religion in a nutshell. And Danny Van Heck says, of course, Trump isn't as bad as Hitler. Far from it. but." It just kind of says there are a lot of stupid people out there. If someone like that can become president, well, surely that's true. And, um, and Danny says Hillary was very corrupt too, though. So it's not like she was that much better. Uh, none of us are that much better in, in all honesty. And, um, you know, I was of the opinion back in uh, the late 90s when Bill Clinton was into his Monica Lewinsky scandal that he should resign and uh, turn over the presidency to um, Okay, I'm having an aged moment. <laughs> Um, his vice president, who had been the senator from Tennessee. Um, the name will come to me. That was a senior moment and a, and a beginning of sort of, it represents kind of the beginning of the end of my uh, doing this sort of thing because uh, as I age, I'm starting to lose some of the faculties that I had as a youth. And when it gets too embarrassing, I will stop. But for the moment, I'm going to press on. 
um, and um, who knows, maybe his name will come to my mind. But in any, in any case, um, we have to start, we have to start taking up sides. We have to um, start seeing our fellow Americans as fellow Americans or our fellow Germans as fellow Germans and uh, find solutions. I mean, one of the problems uh, that we have that's very much in current affairs right now uh, is our immigration problem on the southern border. And the an answer is now and has always been obvious, but um, our politicians refuse to see the solution because why do people come to the United States or try to come to the United States? They come because even though they know their life won't be that much better, uh, their children's lives may be uh, better than it is in their own home countries. So for all the money that we spend on walls, uh, we could spend that money on helping the countries of Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, and so on, or uh, Costa Rica. And uh, then there would be less incentive for people to uh, come to the United States. And that would be a much more humane solution. And, you know, as George Patton was noted to have said, um, and I've seen the movie, so therefore it must be true. <laughs> He, he's George uh, C. Scott said in the movie Patent, Patton, um, fixed fortifications are a monument to the stupidity of man. And so that's obviously been the case with our uh, walls, uh, both in Berlin, and the Berlin Wall was a fixed fort fortification and it lasted for whatever it was, about uh, 28 years, but ultimately it fell. And in the same, by the same token, uh, you know, a wall isn't keeping illegal immigrants, so-called illegal immigrants out of the United States. And uh, so we need another solution that's uh, a better solution. And that solution has to do with helping their countries make their uh, lives better there, so they won't want to leave their homes. Um, yeah, yeah, we all need copious amounts of notepads for our journal entries. And Danny Van Heck said, well, I'm going to leave, Danny, I'm going to leave uh, these political back and forth um, out of this for the time being, um, except in brief references, for example, um, but uh, because I don't want to be arguing the pros and cons of any political position per se. I mean, we all have to reflect on those things. So you can mention them, but I'm not sure I'm going to comment on them. Okay, so I've been reading two books in tandem, and the other book is, um, is The Unseen Partner by Diane Croft. And by the way, both of these authors will be coming on to the Wisdom Path um, sometime soon. Diane Croft will, uh, has two scheduled appearances with us. One is on April the 11th and one is on April 25th. So if you want to speak to her uh, directly about her experiences and about uh, things that happen in her book, uh, you are, uh, you're welcome to uh, join us at that time. And I'll, I'll just take a moment to get out the, um, the link so that you can get to that. Um, 
Just give me a moment here. Okay, so what I'm giving you, if you haven't already uh, joined our wisdom path, uh, especially for the YouTube followers, uh, this is the link to the uh, wisdom path and our other uh, sessions. And um, if you go to that link, you can uh, elect to receive notices uh, about our uh, future programs so that you won't miss anything. And I'm going to put it into the Zoom as well. Although if you're on the Zoom, chances are you already are on the list. And I see we have a, a new guest here uh, in the Zoom panel. And Angelique, you're welcome. And if you have anything to say and you want to speak up, uh, please do. You, I don't require that you either show yourself or speak. But if you have a comment that you'd like to make, please just feel free to do that. Okay, um, and so the next segment that I'm going to read, and this is um, from the Unseen Partner, um, and keeping in mind that I regard this as an excellent basic primer on what it means to individuate. And so we're in the beginning of the book, and so there, we're talking about the early experiences. And this particular segment is entitled Fragrances. And uh, so the poem reads, on the balcony overlooking your stage, the wonder of your presence, tasting your intoxicating aroma, allowing me to breathe fragrances of living holding back my applause, lest I be noticed in my eagerness. <laughs> cool. And so here's the balcony in Dr. Croft's selection. And that's balcony frescoes and villa in Pompeii, a photo by Gaius Cornelius in 2008. And then this um, quote, washed, I suppose that's an Arabic word for ecstasy is in brackets. Washed is used synonymously with dock, tasting, a mystical experience. So I'll read that again. Um, washed ecstasy is used synonymously with dock, tasting, a mystical experience. And that's from Sarah Sviri's The Taste of Hidden Things. And then uh, Dr. Croft's commentary. Fragrances. When you, when you become aware of an unknown presence within, it feels like a drama is taking place. In this poem, the drama has begun, but I am only an observer at this stage. I will not remain so. The very act of an encounter with the archetypal self drags the individual involuntarily into the process. Union analyst Edward Edinger describes the experience. Quote, the status of remote observer is not possible in the process of an encounter with the unconscious. You can't see it as it really is unless you participate. And then by the bare fact of, wit of witnessing the nature of the unconscious, you change it and you are drawn into the divine drama that it is an expression of." Unquote. The archetypal self acts upon the ego. The ego responds to the direction of the self and both are changed in the process. It's an experience that cannot be fully grasped by the mind only felt and intuited like a taste of something mystical. Um, I can vouch for that from my own experience. Um, when I had my 
first major experience with my unconscious, it emerged as a um, as a possession by my anima that lasted uh, it lasted eight months, and it emerged as a novel. And, uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment, but it was uh, quite a powerful experience in which an archetypal enemy, uh, entity, uh, namely my anima, woke me up every day and required me to write her story. And that didn't stop until um, it was done. And when it was done, then I could stop and I could then reflect on it and what it meant. And if, fortunately, I knew a little bit about Jungian psychology at that time, but that was one of the major facts that got me on this road of, of uh, talking about Dr. Jung's work. Um, Okay, so now I'm going back to a mystical path less traveled, a union psychological perspective. Um, we create theological words, names, and doctrines, and assume we know what that which has been named. Yet what we know is only the name we have attached to the mystery that has come calling. That name is part of the foreground, while the background remains obscure, unknown, and ultimately unknowable. What we do know all too well, however, are our human capacities for great good and great evil. We know this from our motivations and behavior they are experiential facts verified by our human history and our personal history up to the present moment. Theologically, we may speculate as to the origins of those capacities in the far off background, yet their operations in and through the human psyche need our greater attention. Okay, so Dr. Um, Dr. Wright's point is a basic point in Jungian psychology that we know far too little about ourselves and how we actually operate. And um, as Dr. Jung put it in his BBC interview, um, the world hangs by a thin thread and that is the psyche of man. Um, and the point is that if that thread breaks, um, we can destroy the planet. And so we have to become much more conscious of what the human species is capable of doing. That's the essential point. Um, and uh, we just don't know enough as we stand here. And Dr. Jung frequently referred to a verse in um, the first letter of John called First John, um, chapter four, verse one, which is um, examine the spirits, whether they be of God or not, uh, because we, we can get bad ideas as well as good ones. <laughs> And the bad ones are destructive, as we've seen very um, explicitly in the month of January in the United States. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Danny. He says, I uh, can understand you don't want to get too much into politics. It can get pretty toxic and divisive and correct. Um, you know, as, a, as an American military officer, I served 23 years in the US Marines. And during that time, I never 
recall a single time when I thought about the political party of my fellow Marines. We were all putting our energy into being Marines at that time. And, <clears throat> and of course, politics is prohibited in the United States by the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So that means that, um, that people in the military are not allowed to um, do anything with respect to uh, religion or polit politics. Um, I'm sorry, we are allowed to go to church and we have chaplains, but we are not allowed to do anything in politics. And when we start to become political, um, we have to get out of the military. And this is, in recent years, this is what happened to General Stanley McChrystal, who uh, started to get political. And uh, he was called home by um, President Obama and asked to resign, which he did. And the same thing happened to Douglas Mac MacArthur, who was you know, the greatest leader of the Pacific theater in World War II. But when he started to get too political, um, he had to resign uh, from, from the army after many years. And he had been the army chief of staff, uh, for example. Um, and he was the army chief of staff before World War II, long before. Uh, and he came back into the army. Uh, when he retired from the US Army, he went to the Philippines and, and led the Filipino army until World War II came along. And then he came back into the US Army to lead the US. So um, the next segment of uh, Diane Croft's book, The Unseen Partner, Love and Longing in the Unconscious by a Diane Croft. Um, memory. And as I said, I, I consider these uh, steps that Dr. Croft is taking as among the major steps of individuation. So if you follow along through this whole book, you will perhaps grok what individuation is about. Um, Memory, I am the wind howling outside my window, chasing dead leaves with happy madness. I am the rain drenching my coat, soaked in torment, cold, hard, forcing my head down. I am the night covering me in memories of how I was before I slipped into this mindfulness. And so the image that she selected for this poem is uh, devilish wind uh, is the image and it's from 1853 from Kyoka Hyaku Monogatari in Japan and the quote from St. Augustine Confessions <clears throat> as I rise above memory where am I to find you? If I find you outside my memory, I am not mindful of you. And how shall I find you if I am not mindful of you? And then Dr. Croft's commentary. Memory. Most of us seek to complete ourselves by becoming successful in work love, family, and relationships. The first half of life is consumed with fulfilling these passions and occupies most of our thoughts and energies. But by the second half of life, we begin to wonder, is this it? The devilish winds pick up and remind us of something we have forgotten, something we were once a part of before we slipped into this mindfulness, i.e. state of mind. Jungians see this as a memory of our forgotten relationship with the primordial self, a center of wholeness prior to our state of duality. When we are 
when we were part of the natural flow of life. The question remains, as St. Augustine aptly put it, how shall I find you? How do I, as a conscious human being, regain my, my connection with the self, the beyond that is within? The poet Rainer Maria Rilke points the way, quote, for the gods want to know himself in you. I'm sorry, not plural. For the God wants to know himself in you, unquote. Only we mortals can establish a conscious relationship with the transpersonal self, the larger and much older center of the living psyche. Okay, so here I would point out that the transpersonal self that we refer to here is um, the collective unconscious. And so it manifests itself and did manifest itself on uh, January the 6th uh, because that represents a, a part of uh, the psyche of the American nation, let's say, the collective of the American nation. And so it is incumbent upon us to decide what we will do about it. And uh, welcome to Kushbu Kantaria, my friend from India, uh, from whom, with whom I, I wrote, or I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't write, I certainly didn't write. Uh, I re read uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which you can find on this YouTube channel. And uh, we will be celebrating uh, Kushbu's birthday on April the 2nd. And uh, we're going to uh, celebrate it by having a watch party uh, through Amazon Prime uh, of the movie Ajanta about the discovery of the Ajanta caves in India. And so I, I urge you to join us in the watch party and to celebrate Kushbu's birthday. Um, Manuel Asiskip, I would be good for you to drink something while reading, talking for so long that you, uh, thank you for the effort. Uh, you're quite right, I, need, I do need to drink something, a little coffee wouldn't hurt. Nicholas Chan says, Nick, my friend Nick says, how many years were you in the military for for in total skip well the answer is all my life because i was born into the military and uh, to this day i carry a military id card as a retired officer uh, my active service was 23 years though, uh, long of which three years was on active duty uh, during which time i was deployed to vietnam uh, but I served 20 years in reserve. And uh, so I spent uh, five years in the 8th Tank Battalion and five years with a, an army uh, public affairs unit in Tokyo. And then I came back and uh, ultimately I became uh, the reserve counterpart to the head of standards branch of the US Marine Corps. So that meant that uh, my unit in headquarters Marine Corps was writing all the performance standards for every occupational specialty in the US Marines. And you know, people don't really understand how rigorous military service is, but um, in, uh, we began that effort uh, in, let's see, when was this? This was in the late 80s, we began that effort. And the first thing that we were working on was writing performance standards for pilots. So, you know, whenever you see a military aircraft, that pilot is fulfilling uh, a training standard that's required for the year, no matter what they're doing, even if they're doing a show like uh, the Blue Angels or the 
Air Force uh, flight demonstration team. Uh, they are also fulfilling a requirement uh, of their occupational specialty, and, and these things are very carefully noted down uh, through a pilot's career. And you can think of them as hoops that they have to fly through every year in order to maintain their proficiency. And the result of that, is, if they don't do it, they lose their right to fly an uh, airplane that costs $200 million or something like that. And so uh, pilots are extremely fastidious about fulfilling all these requirements every year. And there's a very long laundry list that is created for every aircraft in the Marine Corps. Uh, but it's also true now of every occupational specialty. So every, uh, every job in the Marine Corps um, has specific things that must be accomplished in order to um, in order to satisfy the requirements of the Marines. And so my reserve role before I broke my leg was to uh, write these performance standards, which I did in my reserve duty um, at headquarters Marine Corps. Uh, but then in January the 4th, 1990, uh, I slipped on the ice at Marine Corps Base Quantico and broke my leg, uh, which was an ignominious way of leaving active service. Uh, but the Marine Corps put me on active duty for six months to repair my leg. And uh, subsequently, I had to have my ankle replaced. So it's been a long haul. But in any case, uh, in answer to your question, that's a long answer to a short question. Um, all my life I've been involved with the military in one way or another. And even this afternoon, uh, now that I've been vaccinated, uh, I'm going to go to the Navy Exchange here in Annapolis and have my hair cut, uh, which will be only the second time I've had my hair cut by an outside agency other than my wife throughout our entire uh, uh, quarantine. Uh, so Danny says, love the BBC interview with Young. He comes across as such a thoughtful and kind person. Uh, on my Facebook page, I've highlighted three pics of my father followed by three pics of Dr. Young. Um, very appropriate. I mean, I, Dr. Young is like my father too. Um, and, you know, if I, if I were to envision God right now, I think I would envision Young. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, skip ahead a little bit in Dr. Um, Dr. Wright's book, Mystical Path, Less Travel. And uh, there is an important uh, journal entry here that's worth reading to you. Um, when the divine is located within matter, within nature, and within our human nature, we are the embodiment and the instrument, the conduit of divinity everywhere and all of the time. We have the power to heal or to hurt, to create or destroy, to love or hate, and to connect or divide. We are then full-time religious beings. Every decision is a religious spiritual decision. Every person we meet presents an image of the divine, whether or not the person has that self-identification. With that orientation, what that worldview and self-view, we are empowered because we have the resources to draw on regardless of the situation. We have the power of divinity itself. We have the responsibility to co-create the future. And yes, 
we have the power to destroy as well. Some have the notion, the fear, that if there were no theistic God, then we could act as we please, and there would be no reason to act ethically. Actually, the opposite is the case. As conduits of divinity, we would bear more responsibility to behave ethically and compassionately. We must allow our theistic and monotheistic notions of God to die so that we can claim our birthright as conduits of divinity rather than as worshipers of an external deity. Well, that brings a number of things to mind. Um, the first of these is that, um, you know, I've done a lot of travel and work in India. I've been there 44 times, believe it or not, and probably spent about two years there. And uh, when people are greet one another in India, they do it this way. And what they're doing is recognizing the divinity in the person that they're communicating with. And the dot that um, Hindus wear on their head uh, is uh, a symbol of the third eye, which is the divine eye that's in the psyche. And so uh, their religion is really far ahead of Western religions in the sense that they recognize that these things are in the psyche and they are in us. Um, so that's one point. And uh, my wife is a, uh, is a lay teacher in Tibetan Buddhism. She, um, she did a, th a three year formal retreat, um, but did not take ordination because she was married to me, fortunately. Um, and uh, but she's still a, a lay teacher in Buddhism and, and a very active Buddhist. And uh, she said that there was an interesting idea which that would put this in, in context. She said, imagine that uh, tomorrow morning you wake up and you have an email from God and the email says, um, I'm going on vacation for the next millennia. Uh, so good luck to you. And now how will you live? And you know, that's the point. If God were to take a vacation, if, if the Abrahamic religion God was to take a vacation for a thousand years, what would we, what would we do then? And this is basically the same point that uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Wright is getting to here. Um, and he goes on, perhaps the world is not only in our hands, but in our mouths. Words do create worlds. The three tiered world created by the word God, referring to the theistic being, is no longer a world that can be inhabited by modern consciousness. God has become a lazy word employed when we don't want to do the difficult world work of theological reflection. It is a throwaway word as OMG in the modern lexicon or as a blessing at the end of a sneeze. It will be an awkward, difficult transition to find and use words and images that preserve the mysteries at the heart of life without evoking the image of a supernatural male being. Furthermore, simply altering the gender by changing father God to mother God will not be enough. Although that rather recent change has validated that our God images are undergoing an evolution. And so it's not enough to change to a feminine God. And you know, we simply have to take responsibility in a godlike manner. Um, and so let me see. Um, <laughs> cool Ranch Doritos says you are one in a billion. Yep, I'm 
definitely <laughs> one in seven and a half billion. <laughs> and um, so I think I'm going to conclude there because I'm losing my voice. And since I haven't had anyone working on the commentary with me, um, I, uh, my voice is dying out, but I, I let's see. Okay, I'll do one more reading from uh, Diane Croft's book because it's fundamental to Jungian psychology. And so I'm reading from The Unseen Partner, Love and Longing in the Unconscious by Diane Croft. And I consider this book to be a primer for individuation. So I think it's a useful book to have on your shelf and to, uh, to uh, meditate on. Each of these two page entries uh, is a different kind of meditation. So this particular page is called Opposites. And of course, that's fundamental to uh, Jungian psychology. So let's follow that. The poem reads, I know nothing of this and everything. I cannot speak nor stop. I see it all in total darkness like a moonbeam in its glowing. You enter me with your quiet passion, causing such a stir I cannot sleep, wide awake in my unconscious. And this is the image she has. Uh, you see a fire there with a bridge across to the opposite. And the name of the image is Expulsion, Moon and Firelight, about 1828 by Thomas Cole, founder of the Hudson River School. Um, images copyrighted by Fundas Fundacion Colección Thyssen Bornemisa in Madrid. Okay, sorry, my Spanish is very poor and I apologize for that. Okay, and then this quote from Edward Edinger's Ego and Archetype. The innate and necessary stages of psychic development require a polarization of opposites, conscious against unconscious, spirit versus nature. I'll read that once again, because this is a fundamental idea that we, polarization is actually required. So for example, the polarization that reached its apogee in uh, on January the 6th in the, U in the US is actually a necessary stage because it causes us to look at what we're doing, both sides. Uh, so I'll read it again. The innate, the innate and necessary stages of psychic development require a polarization of the opposites, conscious versus unconscious, spirit versus nature. Now here's Dr. Croft's commentary, opposites. Prior to the development of ego consciousness, the self contains the totality of our being. It does not discriminate between good and evil, light and dark spirit and matter, all is contained within. This is referenced mythically in Isaiah 45, seven, quote, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things, unquote. As we begin to separate from our original state of wholeness and develop a separate sense of I, we become bipolar. I am this, not that. If we become too one-sided in any dimension of ourselves, too good or too evil, the unconscious self will attempt to counterbalance our one-sidedness. Thus, we find ourselves saying and doing the unconscionable. In this poem, the opposites are held as equals, depict depicted in the bio polar states of inflation, I know everything, and deflation, and nothing. 
let me read that sentence in a different way here. In this poem, the opposites are held as equals depicted in the bipolar states of inflation and deflation. Uh, and then in another way, um, in this poem, the opposites are held as equals depicted in the bipolar states of I know everything and I know nothing. In Thomas Cole's painting, he balances the moon, cold, lunar, feminine on the left side and firelight, hot, solar, male on the right. Jung believed that a natural self-regulating balancing function in the psyche is driven by autonomous forces in the self, not by the ego. And so I'll just read this poem again. It's called Opposites. I know nothing of this and everything. I cannot speak nor stop. I see it all in total darkness, like a moonbeam in its glowing. You enter me with your quiet passion causing such a stir, I cannot sleep. Wide awake in my unconscious. Okay, so that will be our the conclusion for today because my voice uh, can't manage anymore, um, but I hope you enjoyed this session. I certainly have been enjoying uh, reading from these two books and I hope it's been useful to you. Manuela says, Debbie and you are fortunate to share your paths and be partners, admire you both. Have a nice week, Skip. Thank you, Manuela. And uh, perhaps tomorrow we'll see you for, um, tomorrow we'll be doing um, the court cards of um, the suit of wands from the Tarot in our regular 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time class on the Tarot as a roadmap for life. <laughs> cool Ranch Dorito says, I guess that would make eight of you on the planet. Well, I guess I know at least two others and they are uh, Diane Croft and Jerry Wright. Uh, there have been many others um, over the years and I don't claim to be, have any wisdom of my own. I just read people who have wisdom <laughs> and maybe my wisdom is, is knowing that what they've said is important and trying to share it with you. I hope you see it that way. Um, so I, I guess we're up to 8 billion according to the, the big cat. Yeah, no doubt. It's very likely. I know that the, the populations have been growing. They say that once we get to 10 billion, then we'll level off just naturally. Um, I don't, I don't know what says that we're going to level off naturally at 10 billion, but uh, it's a lot. And so anyway, yeah, thank you for being with me today. And, um, and I'll see you next week at this hour. And uh, I will continue with these readings next week. I've enjoyed it. Seems good. So see you soon. Um,